I'm going to do an amateurs versus pros here. Ams versus pros. And what does this mean? We're going to talk about the differences today between why they're able to be so successful and why amateurs typically aren't able to reach any of their goals. Um, and when I mean any of your goals, I mean the big goals, okay? So typically, and I'm going based off stats. So yes, are there people that have? Yes, but we know certain stats about amateurs. We know that the average, uh, or the average male drives ball at 220, okay? Now, are there some that drive at 310 that are amateurs? Yes, there are, okay? But that means if you only have three people, like then that means another one's driving it 100 and something. Okay, so the thing is this, we know these certain things. We know that after three years, most likely that amateurs aren't getting any better anymore. They've reached their peak. Now, why is that? They've used up their athletic ability and no longer will they be able to get better. So how many players do you know that are able to go shoot? Um, let's just use a player who shoots 80. Now, does that amateur shoot 80, 82, 79, 78, or does he shoot 80, 96, 78, 94? Um, I'll take the guy that's, you know, shoots 80, 82, 79, 78, versus the guy who shoots 74 and 94. That's why I say to me, some people are like, you're crazy, Eric. How can um, scratch players not be any good in your mind? Because to me, if a scratch player is, which this is the whole crazy thing about a handicap system that we have, eight of your best 20 rounds. That's it, okay? So literally, um, I can shoot an average of, uh, let's just say I'm shooting near par on the course eight times, but I also have these massive blow-up rounds. And I can shoot a 90, let's just say. To me, that's not a good player. Like I like to look at averages more and see where you average. Not eight of your best 20 rounds. To me, that is very um, misrepresentative of who you are as a golfer. So I think if we had the re real details of who golfers are in America, they would actually look way worse than what, what we think it is, of like an average of, I think lately it was near an 18 handicap, I think, uh, is the average handicap. Okay, so that means that eight of their best scores is um, high 80s, about, on a typical course, about, okay? That would be the average um, golfer in America. So really, if you took a true average then, if going to the handicap system I was talking about, they're going to be well into the 90s okay so why is that though that's what this video is about okay what is the difference and it's not there used to be this thing about time um that um you know people would claim that oh all you do is hit 250 balls a day or spend eight hours a day hitting balls if i can do that i can do that too no you can't i and i still hear lessons come to me and tell me i'm not looking to become a pro or anything and i'm like oh if you're looking to become a pro, you probably would have been shooting in the 60s when you were 12. You know, Jordan Speed shot 62 at 12. Um, golfers are very good from a very young age. They figure out something. They figure out how to do the things that amateurs can't do on their own. Like, to become a really good golfer, like, amateurs have figured out that you don't club, close the club face by going like this, which most amateurs do. They figured out at a young age to twist the club face. They learned that the power is in here. That way they can use their body. They learned it, okay? So Rory McIlroy, McElroy, like he has this big, he goes down and then up a ton. He wasn't taught that. He learned that. He was trying to hit the ball on. So what is the difference between him and somebody else that was hitting balls around the time? I don't know. He, he was motivated, but there was something in him that allowed him to figure out how to do that on his own without somebody saying, hey, here's how you do it, right? So the difference between AMs and pros um, this is what I find, and I, I'm not saying every amateur needs to become a pro, but I run a lot of programs that are six months to a year, and there's a there's usually a, a typical um, stage that I, I, I learn about things with people and, and what they're doing, and most people are really good, okay, about things, but there's, you know, some, and not not everybody succeeds in the program that I that I have, and why? Because they quit doing it, and I and I ask for 15 minutes a day, that's it, and and they stop doing it because it, it can, it can get a little rigorous, right? And um, they feel like they're failing at times, so you know I guess it, so they quit, and they feel like well, what does it matter? But I'll tell you what I've heard from quite a few of them who come back to me after, and so they really regret how they acted during the program and towards the end of it because it, it was a huge opportunity they have. And that's why I tell them everyone I'm at the beginning, just think about this. You're talking about six months to a year 
to become a pro golfer. Now I've had golfers go from 14 to scratch, okay? I've had a five go to a plus two. I've had an 18 now to a six. I've had crazy results, but every one of those people that did it, guess what they did? They followed my program exactly every day. What is the program about? So at least 15 minutes a day, and it's a lot of just at 15, of feedback and drills that are typically slow motion drills. Yes, there's hitting drills, but um, we have feedback key. So that's what you'll see me when I'm prior sliding here. People looking like, what were you looking at, Eric, when you're doing that video? Because I got mirrors up here, a mirror here. So if I am, let's just say I'm working on um, my takeaway, okay? I wouldn't just sit there and go, how's that? You know, I wouldn't do that at all. I would sit there and go, okay, I'm set up. I got my camera in front of me. I'm checking my setup here. I would have some kind of plan of what I'm doing to check it. So I may do a one-handed drill here. So I'm going to go just get to my thigh. And I'm also going to look in the mirror and see what I see. So I should, I know that this should be getting closer to my thigh at this point. I know this should be facing the ball. I'm also going to look in the mirror to make sure I didn't sway off of it real bad or did my hips go this way. Okay. So then I may even come here and look at this and then watch myself here and see what my hips are doing. But so feedback. Okay, it, it's key. Without feedback, we're never going to get any better. We, we just won't. And it's most people you sit at the driving range just hitting 7 after 7 after or driver after driver don't get better. What they do is they figure out after hitting so many of them at the range how to hit some okay because their bo our bodies are so good at self at just coordinating itself around our mistakes that we give it. So it's really good at helping us out. And, um, but if we're just going to sit there and hit these seven irons over and over, we don't learn. What we need to do is, let's say I just hit one, okay? And let's say I just, um, it's, let's say it started off to the left and faded to the right. What would I do, okay? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to analyze it. I'm going to go like this. Well, what did I do? Okay, the club had to be open to my path. My next question would be this. Okay, so the club was open to the path. Notice how I haven't mentioned my body or anything yet. Club was open because everybody else will start with, oh, my hips didn't clear or my shoulders didn't do this or something. But, okay, so club was open, or the club face was open in my path. I know that because it's been spun to the right. Now, I know that it started left of my target line. Um, I'm going to guess maybe two. So I'm going to say negative, negative two. And I know it didn't curve much. So I know my path couldn't have been that much to the left of it. Okay. So just a, a little bit, okay? I'm going to say just a little bit over that. So I want to fix it. I want to actually go for a draw shot, okay, out of that, out of that pattern. I'm going to say, okay, so now I need to get my path going this way and my face to be inside it. So what I'm going to work on is this. I, I won't take a swing the next one without just going, okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit it. You know, I would never do that. I'm going to go up like this. I'm going to go, okay, what is that going to take? It's going to take me coming in from the inside. I'll probably exaggerate it. So I'm coming in from here. So you can tell I'm going to swing way outside. On that path, though, I know my face right here is close to it. And I'm going like that. Okay, now I just rehearsed it, my, what I want to do. Now, whether I accomplish it, I don't know if I will or not here, but we'll see. So thankfully, we have TrackMan to tell me I did it. So my path, I tried to do it a lot, was 11. Face was an eight. So I got a real huge high draw there. Um, tack angle was three down. So, you know, I carried it basically with an eight iron, 160, and it drew, left it a little bit on right. But I changed it by looking at it. Now, let's say that I looked at it. Now, I knew I would have still known that out there without seeing this. I would have said, okay, that ball started way to the right of my target. So I'd go, oh my gosh, that was way to the right. That had to be. Um, because remember, face angle dictates where the ball starts. Very, very close to this. So it says way to the right. I'm going to go, I, I, I mean, I know the answer was eight and a half now, but let's just say I guess I go, okay, it was a 10. And then I saw a curvature, but it wasn't a huge amount of curvature, but I know it curved. So I know my path had to be outside that and my club face was in it. So let's say I just guessed 10. Well, then I would go, whoa, my path was like a 13. Okay, Eric, I overcorrected big time from that last one. So I'm going to go like this now. I'm going to go, okay, I want to fix that. I'm going to go try to make it, let's say I'm going to try to go with a four path and a two face. So I'm going to go to here and go, okay, this is where I judge it. Barely behind my hands here and to here. 
and there. Okay, so that's going to hopefully get closer to what I want. So I'm going to try to get closer to like a 4 2, something like that. Now, I don't, I don't think I did it because it's further out to the right, at least face angle. So that's a straight push. I did 6-6. Six, six. So, but I would have known that, that, but I brought my path down from like a 12 to a 6, okay? Um, but I was trying to go for a 4-2, and I went, on, I went to a 6. So I know I still need to get my path down a little more, less to the right, and then I'm still going to have to get my face a little more closed because it was at a 6 instead of the 2 I wanted. So I'm going to rehearse it. Feel I'm going to feel the face coming about here and closing a little more. Okay? Let's see how I can do with it. So I'm going to feel like I'm going to try to go a little bit to the right again. We're all trying to, I'm trying to cure that first one that I did going through this process, right? Now, I think I overcooked that because I could tell I swung out to the right. I did. So that was a five. So my path was much better than a negative two face. So I was so concerned because the last few times I couldn't get the face shut. So it was a negative two face. So what happened, I would have noticed that the course, I would have gone, oh shoot, that started right at my target and curved pretty heavy. Meaning I know my face was shut pretty big to the path. Okay. So that's a process you go through. Okay. Now I don't see amateurs doing that. So what I see the answer is they hit one, they go shoot. And most of it's like this. They go hit, and I see this. It's called raking. Well, usually you keep both hands on it. Rake, there. something like this. You guys have seen this, haven't you, before? And you haven't even looked up yet, right? Kind of like this, and then raking. There we go, let's see. Oh, shoot, I just topped it. You know what I'm gonna do now? I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna rake it. I'm gonna keep my head down. You guys ever seen that? <laughs> Hopefully I give you a laugh, but that's, I see it every day when I'm at work. I really do. I see that process go on all the time. And then these irons don't work. I'm going to go to my driver. Or, you know, the worst is they top it and then they, now it's just keep the head down. Now they don't move anymore because they top it and somebody told them they lifted their head up. Instead of going, oops, you had a positive attack angle would have been the better thought. So hopefully you guys can get it um, and see that it's not a hard process. It's understanding ball flight, okay, which anybody can do with a little bit of time, understand what it takes for the ball to curve and understand like what that means by how much can be done in an hour, figure that out. And once you know that, think about all the changes you can make on the course by that point. I mean, I hit a terrible shot, starts left, goes left. What did I do? So what if I start the ball way left of my target line right, but it fades back in. What was that? Okay, so those are simple questions that need to be answered so we can fix them on the golf course. And that way on the course, we can really work with this. Because my hope is this, is that every, or that the golfer would have a, a path that isn't getting them in huge trouble. Let's, let's say they're even over the top like this, but it, let's say it's not more than a five or six. So that way, they can maybe when they're playing golf just work more on manipulating this face, you know, either stay open or close it more depending on what they're doing. Instead of saying, okay, I'm gonna aim over here now because it's going to the right. How about this? How about going down and saying, I'm gonna close this club face more so it doesn't go to the right. That would be the answer, not path, because path doesn't work. Folks, I hope that helps just how I critically thought through that. I've worked with people on this that have started to understand this process and then understand it and go to the golf course and put it into play. I've noticed five stroke change just like that. Okay. Because think about it. Otherwise you don't know what you're doing wrong and you're going, I hit this shot. Shoot. I lifted my head up. That's what James said. Or you know what? I didn't keep my arm straight that time. This time I'm going to keep trying to keep it straight. Guess what you're doing now? Now you're using internal thoughts to hit the golf ball. When I'm hitting a golf ball. So I may do this. Let's say I'm on the golf course. I may take a practice swing. Let's say, Let's just use an example. Let's say I have early extension issues, okay? So I'm gonna start maybe here. I'm gonna go like this and go. So I really worked on getting these feelings, right? But then when I get up over this thing, you know what I'm gonna think? Something external. I'm gonna think like this, that I see, let's say I have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on a path up here. I'm gonna know that I'm gonna come down up here with my club as my low point. 
And that's all I thought about, an external thought. We can, our bodies will self-organize really well if we just get out of the way and give it an external thought. So folks, I hope that helps you. Eric Silver, EGS Golf Academy. Thanks for watching.